were soaking in the global gyan right here in the south of France, one man was busy brokering and negotiating one of the world's largest acquisitions in the digital space. I'm talking about none other than the WPP CEO, Martin Sorel. Sorel stunned the advertising industry by buying out one of the world's most prestigious digital agency, AKQA. All this at a time when he himself was surrounded by a mammoth controversy around his pay package, with 60% of WPP investors voting against his proposed remuneration. I caught up with the man himself to discuss AKQA, his views on his compensation package and the global economy. Thank you so much a for joining pleasure. us, Martin, pleasure. once again. And many, many congratulations on uh, two very big acquisitions. Yeah. So I want to talk about AKQA. Fine. Uh, and how, how that panned out. And I believe uh, you've said in the past that you, you know, you've been rejected by them twice and you yeah, got third right. time so lucky. If you propose, you should propose three times. So we tried twice before and failed. So third time lucky. So we, we, we had a conversation with them at uh, CES in, in Las Vegas at the beginning of January. And that continued discussions we'd had uh, going back to, I think, 2007, 2008. And uh, we tied the, tied the knot, as you know, in can. What was the key uh, factor that actually got this marriage together? You know, AKQA is a very strong brand, one of the strongest, if not the strongest, independent, quotes unquote, brands. We voted agency, digital agency of the year on both sides of the Atlantic and in Asia and elsewhere. The other part of it was that they have applied technology in the same way that we've done. Uh, and so you've got a marriage of creativity and technology. And so now we're talking about a geographic development. They're at $250 million approximately of revenue, so a quarter of a billion dollars. You take a global operation like Wonderman, it's about a billion dollars. Take Ogilvy One, it's about $900 million. So those are the two, the only two global networks operating at the moment. AKQA, like VML, is in the 150 to 250 million area. There are no cost synergies here. This is about revenue synergies. And we've already talked to a number of their clients who are very focused on expanding geographically with them. How is in a business going to be impacted, you know, with, uh, you know, a slowdown in what was what is being called the fast-growing uh, well, market. I, I, mean, I mean, all these things are relative. I mean, you say a slowdown, a slowdown to what? So if I look at the first five months of this year, uh, Russia is growing at 4 or 5%, our business is growing at 10. India is growing at 5%, our business is growing at 10. China is growing at 7%, our business is growing at 15 so far. I mean, there will be some impact. So, you know, in a way, you know, when one, one sees all this commentary about crisis, you, you sort of say, what crisis? The world economy is forecast to grow at three, real, <clears throat> plus two inflation is five. Now, if, if advertising stays as a proportion of, the same proportion of GMP, and post layman it, it slumped, and it still hasn't recovered to pre layman levels as, as a proportion of GMP, but so if it stays where it is, that's 5% growth for the industry. We said by budgeting four. I also want to talk about uh, these new structures that you know, seem to have come up in terms of, for instance, for Ford, you've created a new agency. You've created a new agency for Bank of America across teams. Uh, teams. I, mean, these are, I mean, Emphatico was a new agency, uh, <laughs> a, a very you know, sort of brave. Actually, if you think about it logically, it was the right thing. I mean, I know people in the industry campaign and at age who always had a go at Emphatico, which I thought was extremely unfair. It still exists extremely unfair because you would have thought in our industry which is meant to be so innovative the trade press would welcome something that was tailored specifically to the client's needs with with the teams that we've done whether it be for ford or b of a or whoever else you're talking about those teams have been put together by by bringing resources from existing units but uh, how does that work in terms of cost structures for you you take resources from existing units so you take ford team detroit six agencies were fused together I mean, it's a unique example because it was 1,200 people in Detroit. Uh, it's more than 1,200 now. Um, and what we did was to take six agencies, and instead of having six stovepipes, we got one seamless P&L, 
in which the six agencies have internal shareholding. So we solve the, the incentive, we solve the budgets, and we, we've unified the agency. This, that concept, I think, is, is becoming increasingly powerful. If you said to me, what is the biggest difference between this year and last year, it is that. How have you taken the, the, the whole drama that built up on your compensation? Uh, you've agreed to go with what they have to say. There's a process of, of consultation, they call it. I mean, the, the, the pay vote was advisory. We now heard as of yesterday the government will introduce uh, legislation to make uh, shareholder votes uh, binding so we'll, we'll abide with the law uh, you know if it's applicable to us we'll, we'll abide with it we'll, we'll keep within the rules but you know I think you have to look at things very very carefully the the ISS which is probably the most powerful proxy body who recommended a vote against us um, does not apply I mean it's the most extraordinary situation does not apply the same approach and conditions to our competitors. I mean, whether ISS likes it or not, the people we compete with, as you know, you know sitting here in Cannes, is Omnicom is our second biggest competitor, <coughs> our third biggest is Publicis, our fourth biggest is IPG. They, I mean, ISS doesn't even evaluate Publicis, right? ISS evaluates Omnicom and IPG, and it evaluates them uh, against other US companies. So, for example, we had dinner with Time Warner and Jeffrey Bucus yesterday. They compare, would you believe, Michael Roth at IPG and John Wren at Omnicom with Jeffrey Bucus, Philip Doman and Les Mendes. Well, I would look like a hero in comparison to that too. Uh, they also, at least they, they have a real nerve, and this I feel very passionately about, as you're hearing from what I'm saying, they have a, a nerve to make comments about our board and board structure when they have not even looked at the Omnicom board structure. The chairman, the ex-CEO of Omnicom, Bruce Crawford, who I have immense respect for, is now chairman, having been CEO. And I think he's been at the company for something like 35, 40 years, and on the board for goodness knows how long. No member of the Omnicom board is under 60, and most of them have been there for 10, 15, or 20 years. There is no comment in the proxy at all. It just sails through. There is a different standard for our key competitors. Now, ISS would say uh, that that's irrelevant. Uh, I'd like the ISS people to come and run WPP for a day and see whether it's relevant or not. You know, Omnicom comes into the market and they, they buy Adam and Eve. Omnicom is competing for us on the Unilever Media Review. I mean, IPG is too. They are our competition. And I think there has to be a sense of realism in this analysis. Now, the, the whole debate has shifted from bashing bankers to what is pay for performance, which is what, you know, 85% of my pay is based on performance. I have made an investment in the company, you know, which we calculated about 40 million pounds. I've not exercised options and sold options and reloaded, as happens in America and happens, for example, at Omnicom. You know, uh, I mean, just be very blunt about it. John Wren, every time his options, not every time, but most times his options best, he sells the options like he did this, this year and then gets allocated more options. 85% sure. of my conversation is based. I've, I have a shareholding of almost 20 million shares in the company, which I've built up over 27 years, and I have not, with, except in one particular situation, which is a personal situation, sold any stock. I keep it. I saw it maybe wrongly as an entrepreneurial opportunity. Last question. Did you buy the Facebook IP? I bought, I bought uh, eight, shares, uh, eight shares for my seven grandkids and my, and my nephew at uh, 32.06. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> very nice talking to you, Martin, and all the very best.